Hello. Um, 10 years ago, my husband and I headed down the Bourbon Trail in search of the perfect product. Um, we had been in the food and wine business for most of our careers and wanted to become producers. Bourbon was exactly the kind of product that I wanted because it has a regional thumbprint and because it's fabulous. Who doesn't know about Kentucky bourbon? So, um, you know, and we, we live in the Midwest. We love the Midwest. It's the, home, it's the home that we choose to be in. So we wanted to find a product that would sort of, um, that would represent this area. We wanted to use a resource here in the product um, to create a, a sense of identity. So we got to drink a lot of good bourbon, but at the end of the trip, we ended up at Kentucky State University, where I met a professor, Dr. Steve Mims, whose knowledge and vision really changed the course of my life. Um, Dr. Mims' entire life work has been on the aquaculture of the American paddlefish. This fabulous fish is related to the sturgeon. So sort of like a freshwater cousin to sturgeon. Um, like the sturgeon, it's an ancient, really prehistoric fish. But um, like sturgeon, it's also capable of producing fabulous caviar. Paddlefish caviar has never really got the credit that it deserves. Um, in caviar circles, it's always considered sort of a lesser tier to the, um, the sturgeon caviars, which are the holy grail of caviar production. But I always say, if you want to know the truth, follow the money. Um, so what they found in the 1980s when they started DNA testing caviar, Ocetra caviar, coming back into the country, that almost all of it was cut with um, paddlefish. So the, the color, the size, the quality of the berry was just, was just as good. So we knew we found our product. Um, the other thing that we learned at Kentucky State was there's this beautiful aquifer under Ohio and Kentucky that's the second largest, largest in the United States and it's considered the most pure. So we had found our resource too. So let me tell you what I know about farming. Um, according to the most recent census, USDA census, the average size farm in America is 400 acres and the average price per acre is $2,000. That's $800,000 for land alone. So you buy a house, some equipment, some animals, you're looking at a million dollars. A million dollars to be a farmer. My suspicion is that some of you in the audience, if you would inherit a million dollars or win a million dollars, your first impulse might not be to go buy a farm. Um, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, it's a lot of hard work. Um, your profit margins are kind of slim. Uh, your outcome is totally dependent on something you have no control over at all, which is weather. And uh, aquaculture is even trickier because your infrastructure costs are greater and you can lose your whole flock you know, on a, in a matter of hours if something goes south. So how does a nice girl like me get into farming if um, I'm not lucky enough to inherit a farm from my family? By using existing resources and by forming non-traditional partnerships. If there were two phrases that were woven into everything that we do with paddlefish caviar, it would be, it would be those two phrases. So the short story of what I do is um, we fertilize eggs in the spring, and then I grow the fish really hard from May to October um, in tanks because they're such large fish, they grow really fast. So this part looks kind of like traditional aquaculture. Aerators running, feeding them uh, feed, and they get big. By the end of the summer, I can get a fish that's about this big. So when they're this big, you can put them almost anywhere, and they won't be eaten by birds or other fish, which lets us do the ranching part. Um, so uh, this is a picture of my fry, just to give you an idea of how tiny they are when we get started. They're like a grains of rice. So um, the way that we, that we start in, um, in these tanks is by using, okay, sorry. Another great piece of uh, information that came out of Kentucky State University was that there are water treatment plants all over the United States that have tanks that are sitting empty. And part of it's because um, they're expanding populations, they're using different technology, and these tanks are easily converted to aquaculture. So, so we're using an existing resource. The tanks are already built. They're not being used for anything. I have access to water, as much water as I want that meets EPA uh, standards. And then we're forming this uh, non-traditional partnership because then I, I, uh, I'm working with, uh, with a city that's doing water treatment. So. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really good for, I'm a green project for them and they have the resources that I need. From there we go into the lakes and we do this thing called reservoir ranching, which is very cool. So when we're stocking fish into lakes, we stock about 20 fish per acre. Um, in classic aquaculture, you might use 
5,000 fish per acre. So just to give you a, a sense of how, how low impact that is. When you're only doing fish at 20 fish per acre, um, you don't need aeration, you don't need food. So we let these fish just swim around free and, um, and eat zooplankton. I like to call it free range caviar. Um, so they go into the lakes uh, at this low density. Um, they won't take a baited hook because they eat zooplankton so they don't compete with sport fishing. Um, they won't reproduce in lakes because they need river environment, so they, you, know, you, you pretty much take out what you put in. You would never find them in lakes unless you put them there, so uh, there's not a question of depleting a natural resource or ownership of, of the fish. And then we come back in the winter, which is the perfect time to harvest caviar because you want a nice fat berry, but you want it to be nice and firm. Um, in the winter, all the other fish are down on the bottom um, hibernating. Paddlefish are like sharks, they have to swim to breathe, so they're still moving around. We use very specific collection gear, we never catch anything else. Um, that we, we harvest them for meat and for caviar, and then anything that we don't use for people food, we give to a pet food company, and they use it for dog food. And the other very cool thing about these fish is they're almost entirely cartilage. There's no bones at all, except one jawbone. So um, they, they dry the cartilage out, grind it up, and use it as a supplement in dog food for um, joint health. So like any new business, we have um, opportunities and challenges. I think one of the greatest opportunities that we have is enhancing rural life. If you spend five minutes on any farming site, you're gonna come across that initiative. It's from the federal government on the way down to the, to the smallest community. It's really important because if you're lucky enough to inherit a farm from your parents, we, we wanna make life good enough there that people stay on farm because we need food to eat. So. Um, the nice thing for me is that I can go into a community, since everything I do is on contract, I can go into a community and I can contract with a, a city that owns a water supply lake. Um, I absorb all the cost and liability. They let me use their water. If it turns out well, I write them a check. They have no infrastructure costs. And um, yeah, and, and it's, they turn a passive resource into a productive resource. The other opportunity that I think is, uh, that I'm personally very excited about is I feel like we could become in the Midwest synonymous with the highest um, level of cultured caviar in the United States. And I know that sounds really grand, but I like to remind people that in the 70s, nobody thought you could grow good wine in California. Everybody knew all the good wine in the world came from Germany and France. And no one would dispute that now, that, that California is one of the best places in the world um, for wine. I've seen wine transform a state, and I feel like maybe caviar production could transform the Midwest. Some of our challenges are because what we're doing is so different, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to talk people into the idea of it, uh, using an existing body of water for um, aquaculture. We're, we're so land and water rich in this country that sometimes we tend to think, you know, this body's for recreation and this one is for watering livestock and this is for, you know, w what we're saying is you can use it uh, for more than one thing. We did a study that if we had access to one-tenth of the existing water, not creating anything new, but the existing water in Kentucky, we, and I don't mean me, I mean there's other people that are doing what I'm doing, um, but together we could create a $10 million uh, industry in Kentucky that was never there before. And that's kind of exciting to think about creating wealth where there was none before. So last year, we're harvesting fish, and uh, there's this beautiful little girl that would come out to the lake every day, and she would just pepper me with questions. And one day, she put her hands on her hip, and she said, I can't believe you signed up for this job. And I thought, it probably doesn't look like that much fun, you know, from the outside. But the other thing I realized is it was finally my job. You know, it takes eight to 10 years for these fish to reach sexual maturity. So I had been planning for and working towards and visualizing this idea of becoming a caviar farmer, and I finally realized it, it was my job. So um, I would say to any of you would-be farmers out there who are like me, born with the heart of a farmer without the land, um, to don't let that million dollar price tag keep you out of the game. You know, by doing what we did, by thinking outside the box, using existing resources, and forming non-traditional partnerships, you too may come up with a food production system that's never been invented. Um, and you could feed the world. And you can do the good work of farming. Thank you.